Good morning. morning. Joyful Sabbath redeemed. What another honor and privilege it is to gather together and worship our King. Thank you, Lexa and Cassie, for the beautiful music taking us through the temple, preparing us. Uh, I, I tease Cassie sometimes because if you're actually here and look close enough, you can see smoke come off that djembe. <laughs> I don't know how she does it. <laughs> Thank you, Heidi and Christopher, for managing all the tech, slides, the video, the sound. And I give you permission, if I, if I go down a rabbit hole, just mute it. <laughs> yeah. And thank you those who have tuned in, our extended family. I pray you do feel connected here and that you, most importantly, feel connected to God. Um, it is just truly an honor and privilege to get to worship him every Sabbath and to do it with you is extra special. Please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for all eternity to be able to sit at your feet and thank you. I long for that day, Lord. You, you brought us together through another crazy week, ups and downs and battles and victories. Your name be praised. You've blessed us with such beautiful music to worship you for time together, for the freedom to actually stand here, open a Bible and speak your words, Lord. And I just ask for not only your presence in our hearts and in your house of prayer here, but it just overflows across the world as there's so many people around the globe worshiping you on this holy Sabbath day, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to share what you've teaching me, what you place in my heart, and may, uh, may it be your words. In your blessed name, amen. Redeemed. I have a question for you, just to think about. What does it mean to you to be valuable? I was talking to a friend a couple weeks ago. He's in college. You know, life, life is about to happen, really, getting out of college. And, and you know, marriage and life. And, and it was interesting spending time with him and the questions that he'd have for Heidi and I about our relationship, our dating time, and, you know, what life is like now and, and that kind of thing. And, and so one day I, I came downstairs to, to get some water, and he, he was down there reading in. And he had some more questions. It was very interesting, these questions. But in, his, in the conversation, he, would, he kept saying and talking about his parents or his dad and saying, I guess he's come into his own now. I guess he's made it now. I guess he, you know. And it was kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I mean, I, I get what he was saying, but I couldn't stop thinking about it because Whenever he would say that, he, he would be talking about financial security, financial security, financial security. And so I had to go get on another call, but I kept thinking about this. And uh, so then at lunchtime, I came downstairs, and he's sitting in there reading, and I said, you know, I know, we are supposed to wait till we're asked. Sometimes I think God truly is asking instead of the person asking. I went, you know, um, I may overstep here, and if I am, I will stop. Um, I felt very parental. I go, my understanding that you're equating your future and your value is your financial security at some point. I go, the reason I've caught this with what you're saying is because I've been there. I go, that's why I went to college. I mean, you go to college, you're going to get a lot of money. That's why my first degree I, I attempted was mechanical engineer because they start with a big salary. That quickly changed because that's a lot of math. <laughs> I changed my degree a lot. I ba- went by starting salaries and just kept going down the list until <laughs> uh, I got something that I could kind of understand. <laughs> um, I, said, I said, it's a dangerous trap. And I go, God had to teach me that uh, after I was married. He had to teach you. He sees the opportunity of a layoff to give me some one-on-one time of what really is important, what really is valuable, what 
where where my value comes from and most of you know you know I, I i went six months solidly just looking for work and nothing i had to work i just have to work i called up my my brother kelly i need to talk to you you know he had unique cabinets i just need a job i'll sweep i just need to work and and god's going it's not like god laid me off but he's going here's the opportunity i have for mike and i needed Two years. Not that I, I still don't need it, but two years was a long time to keep to to remold me from what I had molded myself and my own expectation idea to what God wanted. Um, and that experience is valuable beyond measure. But when I started thinking about this question, the, my first thought was. How do I value others? So um, when I first, I've been doing procurement and supply chain for over 20 years. But my very first job was a junior buyer in purchasing. It was a junior buyer. And, and my boss, my first day on the job, and my boss, he goes, all right, Mike. I'm going to give you some words of wisdom here. You're going to need to find something in this job that makes you love it because 99% of the time, the only feedback you're going to get are people who are not happy with the job you're doing. He goes, now this office, the three of us here, we get what you're going through. We've been doing purchasing for, for a long time. And each one of us, it's something different. You're going to need to find that because that's what's going to keep you going with all the, <laughs> the negative responses you get when, you know, something hasn't arrived on time. And so I'm going, hmm, I was really concerned now, you know, what type of flack am I going to get? And, you know, I better quickly find something. And so I, 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 I was thinking about it, and I'm going through it, you know, and, and, and learning and, and working. And we had a lab, and so there were some chemicals that had to be bought every so often for the lab. And I'm looking at the history of all these chemicals, and, man, it's expensive. And so when I called, called the supplier up, I said, look, this is a history I show. Do you show that? And they said, yeah, I go, but our price has always stayed the same, yet we've had this amount of volume. I said, don't we get into a different price break because of what we order? And he's going, yeah, you do. That one call saved the company my salary at the time. And that was it. I mean, I've always loved to get a good deal, but that was, woo, that's addicting. <laughs> I mean, cost savings in a company. A lot bigger than the cost things I can do in my own personal life. <laughs> and so that was it. Every job since then, my first goal, and it's not always easy, it can take a while, is where I can show that I saved my salary. Because now I've just broken even, the company's broken even. And then anything above that, that's my value. Let's just say, though, some, some jobs I've had, it's hard to do that. I'm no longer valued. I'm not valuable. I'm doing my job, putting the hours. But what I've associated my value to is too fluid. Going to marry Heidi. You know, some cultures you have a dowry. If I had to come up to the money to give a dowry for Heidi's worth, I still wouldn't be married. <laughs> How do I equate financial amount to Heidi? Uh, let's say Aiden. If you looked financially at the time of him being born, he cost me 50 bucks. It's worth quite a bit more than that. We had really good insurance, so it's like, wow, he can cost me 50 bucks. <laughs> He's cost me a lot more since then. <laughs> he can easily devour 50 bucks just in one meal. <laughs> but those, those two years of the cabinet shopping and get me to understand what I'm putting my trust in, equating my value to, is, is ridiculous. It's too fluid. It's not consistent, and it can devastate me. What about my friends here? How do I put value on my friendship with Kelly? What's each memory worth? What's the blood, sweat, and tears worth? What's the, the praying together worth? I mean... 
if we aren't putting our value in actually what God provides and the spiritualness of it, we'll always feel unvalued. And that goes for every one of you. I know some of you who are streaming and some of you I don't know. But even if I don't know you, the fact that you're joining us in worship today, it means a lot. You are valuable. We don't even have to meet you to know that you're valuable because we're all in this together. We are wanting to get through this life as best we can to God's standards to reap that reward he promised us. I was thinking about, you know, trips you take. Well, there's a financial value of it. It costs us much to do it. But what do you experience? How do you put a value on that? So when I, when I was thinking of, of, of my friends and my families and, and who I value so much, each and every one of you, please know that. I started thinking, why is it that when I'm talking to you, when I'm texting you, when whatever I've, I've done, I use priceless and you're a blessing? Why is it that that is what I use, priceless? What makes it priceless? What makes it priceless is because your value comes from God. God placed the value on you. So how can I, hey, Gavin, you're so valued. I, you're, you're valuable to me. Well, how, how do I rate that value? Because I know what God did for Gavin. And I can't put a dollar amount on that. That's, that's value beyond measure. And so I thought I was thinking, well, okay, it's not, it's not just my friends and my family that are valuable then. Because God redeemed everyone. God redeemed everyone. They may not all accept it. And so now it's like, oh my goodness, this is too much, Lord, because now... I know, lady has got that picture of the lamb on the shoulder. There's people that I work with. There's people that I deal with. And I'm going, are they really that valuable? <laughs> I mean, let me know now if they're deciding later down the road that they're just going to burn a lake of fire. And then I can just, you know. But really, I can't equate value to people I love and not use that same equation to people I don't even know or people that rub me the wrong way or people that are offensive. Redeemed. So what is this redeemed? Got to step back just a bit so I can read. These are just a handful of the definitions of redeemed, but I just love them because, you know, we're going to think of God and buy back, get or win back, free from what dis distresses or harms, free from captivity by payment of ransom, release from blame or debt, free from the consequences of sin, change for the better, remove the obligation by payment. Hitting home, isn't it? Exchange for something of value, make good, atone for, offset the bad effect of, make worthwhile. God did that. We are redeemed. He hits all these and even more. But why? I'm going to read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 through 21. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in the last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. I like, a, you know, financials, gold, silver. That's kind of where mindset is on earth where you're talking about finances. My, my father-in-law used to get tickled about this antidote, he would say. He goes, you know, the proverbial saints are lined up to go into heaven. Gabriel's at the gate, welcome each one. And this one guy shows up, and he's just antsy. He's fidgety, he's concerned, he's sweating, he's worried. And it's really, everyone else is praising and singing and glorifying and all this, and the guy stands out. So Gabriel's, what's wrong? I need to go back. And Gabriel's going, 
This is heaven. You know where you just came from. There's really nothing left. I got to go back. I forgot something. I forgot. He goes, trust me. Our Father has prepared everything here. There is nothing, nothing on the stinking earth that has any value to what's here. No, I got you. I got to. I forgot. This is important. And he goes, well, now he's curious. He goes, all right. So he sends him express to earth, pulls him back up, and he's got a briefcase. And Gabriel, I got to ask, what was so important? And he opens up the briefcase. And Gabriel just burst out laughing, just guffawing, doubled over, just, he just beside himself, looking at these shiny bars of gold. And Gabriel goes, you went back for paving stones? <laughs> what do we value? Paving stones. For you bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 6.20. Going back to, to each of you, to my wife and my son. The value. Is, I didn't buy them. God bought them. They are God's. You are God's. You were bought with a price. So how do I treat people that are God's then? How am I supposed to treat myself? I mean, you know, guilt gets me. Uh, the devil can just tear you down. Are you really that valuable? You've passed your 70 times 7, you know. Putting together these messages. I get angry. I will swear, working on slides for a message every time. And I was thinking, Lord, next time's going to be different. Lord, next time. And, you know, it's going along, all right, all right. And then all of a sudden, and I'm, I have to sit there and stop. I'm sorry, Lord. Please help me. The only way this is going to work, you know, and then get back into it. And I'm going, what's wrong? Mike, you're in my word. You're working on what I've placed in your heart, and those are what you, the words you're going to say? I mean, he knows us. We were bought and paid for. We were created. That's, that's the weird thing. How many, in like, like Aiden, we created him. But then I got to go and redeem my creation. Aren't they already mine? But because of sin, because of what Lucifer did, now we have this formula that must, this, this, this law that must be met. The wages of sin are death. We can't pay it. So how much are you worth? This is the question that society likes to answer. These are just some. I mean, we could go all day with different categories. How you fit in, what they think of you, your status, your interests, how you live, education, employment, the list goes on and on. The big thing about trying to fit into this list, you never will. It's too fluid. This society is saying one thing, this other part is saying another. You will never make everyone happy all the time. You will never be able to stand for anything as you're trying to to meet all these requirements. It'll be trying to fit a square into a circle. It won't work. But that is so where we get focused. That is so where overall people get focused. It's, oh my goodness. I've got to try to do this. I got to. You go through your life just stressed and, and never satisfied, never content, never happy, always searching because you're trying to live up to these standards, these values that have no meaning at all trying to get some more paving stones. And what people think of you. I get that. But it's like one day they think you're the cast me out. The next day, man, you offended me. You're out. How you live. No, this, this part, these people accept how I live. Well, these people don't. What do I do? Or do I just add value to Hey, those who agree with what I agree with, then that's, you know, I try to say with them. But even in that, that's too fluid. That will change. How much are you worth? That's a question 
does society ask of us? But the statement is what you are really worth. Now, before I get into this, and I know this sounds silly because I'm preaching to the choir here, but the God family, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit, who's the most valuable? They're all gods. They're all perfect. They're all sinless. So one would seem not more valuable than the other. We're going to start with God the Father. In reference to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, he did not interfere. I can't imagine that. I was, I was, when I wrote that down, I immediately thought of Aiden must have been three, two or three. And we were at one of the, the, the toy stores here, and they had, he loved going there because they had this big wooden train set that you could play with. And it was up off the floor, so you just stand there and play it. And so we show up, and there's a, there's a dad sitting on the bench messing with his phone, and his little boy's playing with the train. So Aiden goes over there, and he gets a train, and that kid goes and takes it. All right. I mean, Aiden's even bigger than the kid, but he never really realizes that. And he goes and gets another train, the kid takes it. And I'm looking at this going, this kid's in trouble. <laughs> Every train Aiden went and started playing with, the kid would take. He's, not even play, he, you know, he's got this whole thing of trains, and he's trying to play and guard his trains. Well, now I'm, I'm angry. I'm going to be a bully. I didn't approach because his dad's sitting right there, but I am. There's no poker face. I'm angry, and I'm staring right at him. And he, he knows what he's doing. And Aiden's kind of like, and, you know, maybe getting a tree or something to do something with. And the kid catches my eye, and I am just glaring at him. I'm so angry. The, hand, the hands come up, the head drops, and he turns around and just starts walking. And his dad's on, you know, where are you going? I want to leave now, Dad. I'm going, Yeah. Yeah, showed that kid. <laughs> Aiden, you got all the trains. Doesn't even come close. His son being crucified. Don't interfere because this is the plan. Not only don't interfere, I need to give my son what is needed to make it through it. So he can deal with the whipping, the beating, the slashing. So he can deal with the nails on the cross and hang there. I would have destroyed everyone at the Garden of Eden, at the Garden of Gethsemane. Forget waiting to this point. That's it. Plan's over. You guys, you're to go. Sustained him and then sacrificed his son for us to redeem us. Isn't that enough? Doesn't that say where we're valuable? I mean, that is enough. It's, and that's just God the Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should have eternal life. He not only loves us, he wants us with him forever. And that's God the Father. Well, now we have Jesus Christ did not change his mind. How do you not do that? He had the authority with connection to his father to call down angels. That's it. Didn't change his mind. He not only, I mean, the wage of sin is death. To meet that, he had to die. That met the requirement. But he also paid our restitution. Sin's got to be answered for. He paid our restitution and died for our sins. Now we have two gods. God the Father and God the Son. Is that a not enough value for us to understand? But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought our peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. He took it for us. We can't leave out the Holy Spirit. All three gods did not give up. Christopher, your message in the presence and, and 
enlightening on that scripture about God did not turn his back. Huge. I mean, just huge. And Holy Spirit did not. I mean, you we know when they're screaming for Barabbas and we're thinking, man, the devil's just having a heyday here. The Holy Spirit's not twiddling his thumbs. He is on it. He still keeps us linked to the God family and consistently pursues our heart nonstop. But he did not give up. And why? I mean, there's hearts to reach. Specifically, there's two that are about to die. Two hearts are about to die. And they're on the cross being crucified with Jesus. And the one heart, instead of screaming and cursing at the Romans who did this to him, even though it's the penalty for what he did, he turns to Jesus on the cross. He turns to the only one that can save him and starts cursing him and mocking him. The only one there in the whole, whole world that can save him. And that was how he spent his last breaths. But the other thief, the other thief is proof that the Holy Spirit did not give up because he not only defended Jesus on the cross, and I'm going, I, I like to think that these two, I'm sure they heard stories of Jesus because with what's going on, how could they not spread? But I would think this is their only time of seeing Jesus. They both see Jesus the same environment, the same time, for the same amount. And the one curses him and mocks him. And this one looks at Jesus, who I'm sure is unrecognizable, and says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. How does that happen? Because the Holy Spirit was going. He was working. He did not give up. God the Son is on the cross. He sees him, and he's going, this is part of the plan, and this is the opportunity. The Romans, surely this was the Son of God. Where does that come from? The Holy Spirit. Didn't stop. So while Jesus is on the cross, God the Father is sustaining him. The Holy Spirit is churning on all the hearts. How valuable are we? And then here's the kicker. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. At that moment in time, obviously, he has died for people who had already lived a sinful life. So that's, that's a view that, hey, he died for sinners. At that point in time going forward, he was dying for people who weren't even born yet, who haven't even done their first sin yet because he loves us that much. While we were still sinners, Christ died. So why did we let our sin just tear us down? Why did we give devil that much power when God knows it? He goes, yeah, you're sinful. I've redeemed you. You're mine. You want to live with me forever? I, I, I just, as digging into that, I'm just going, you know, it's, Obviously, all three gods are involved in this, but I'm just going, that's overwhelming value. Overwhelming value. Turn with me to Titus. Chapter 3. Verse 4. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. What's your definition of value? Don't let yourself fall into the trap of equating. And I know this is, my, this is easy for you to say standing here, hard to do when you're in it. I get that. But you need to be preparing now for when you're in it. 
Do not let your challenges, your difficulty, your sin, your frustration, your hurt, your anger, your illness, everything that sin brings into our lives, do not let any of it change your perspective of your value. Never. That's expected. That's why God's biggest promise in this, one of his biggest promise, is you will have trouble. God is on your side. God is standing for you. He's redeemed you. They love us more than we can even imagine. Eternity is not enough time to understand that love. And what we deal with every day is not equal to how we are valued. Now, I was thinking of that because, you know, it's not like, you know, when I'm struggling, when I'm, when I'm hurt, or, you know, I know people who are dying or sick or whatever the case may be. You know, you're just, you're witnessing what sin does in this world. Or even worse scenarios that you read in the news that I just can't imagine. If anything, that should bring us closer to him to realize our value. Because if we were not valuable, this would not have happened. If we were not valuable, we would not know the story, how the story ends. If we were not valuable, this whole, this whole world would have destroyed itself long ago. He wants us. He can't be more clear with that. All three of them sacrificed for us before we were born, for us. First Peter 2 9. I like how this reads, King James. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Yes, we live on a dark planet, but that's why God calls us to be his light. And a light's not good if it's not dark out. But it's not like we live in t- we're, that we are living in darkness all the time. Hence the importance of our light, the oil for our light, being connected every day, all day long. We are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We are redeemed because God did not interfere. We are redeemed because the Holy Spirit didn't quit. We are valuable. And it's not just, not just, I hate you saying just when it comes to God. He, he was sacrificed. He died for us. He redeemed us. Like I said, at least th- for, the, for us, before we were born, before we committed our first sin. And then what did he do? He quickly went, as John 14 says, do not be discouraged. He quickly went to heaven to prepare a place for us. Not only have I redeemed you, I've got your house ready. I've prepared a place for you because you'll come to heaven. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you choose this gift? He redeemed those who refused to choose the gift. He redeemed those who will burn in the lake of fire. And I can't imagine the heartache he'll feel on that day. I did everything. We did everything to redeem everyone. And some will still say no. Some will still not see the value in it. Some will still rather have society's value and not want God's because apparently That's it. I must have said something right. (laughs) God's rules 
As David say, I find a delight in your precepts. They're not to control us. They're not to burden us. They're not to weigh us down. They're not to discourage us. They're not to make us feel unworthy. They are to lift us up. They are to make us holy. They are to draw us closer to him. They are for us to be accountable to him and accept who he is willingly and freely and joyfully. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have redeemed us. They have called us by name, and they will take us home. We just have to accept the redemption. Redemption. 